Hi all, this week we're going to start to talk about genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. In a GWAS experiment, your biological goal is to find genomic regions associated with a complex trait. I'm going to spend the rest of this video explaining this sentence. What do I mean by genomic regions? What do I mean by associated with? And what do I mean by complex trait? I'm going to start by talking about complex trait because we've already talked about kind of the opposite of a complex trait, which is a Mendelian trait. Go way back to one of our first videos, and you'll see me talking about these round and wrinkled peas that were described by Gregor Mendel, where we get the word Mendelian. And in our round and wrinkled peas, we only saw either round or wrinkled. And we saw that there was just this one locus, R, that determined whether the P was round or wrinkled. So the genotypes big R, big R, and big R, little r resulted in the round P shape, whereas the genotype little r, little r resulted in the wrinkled P shape. So in other words, there's one trait that is round or wrinkled, and it's determined by one locus, that is R. There's no in-between here. This is a Mendelian trait. A complex trait isn't an either-or type trait like a Mendelian trait. One of the most famous examples is height in adult humans. We don't have just short people and tall people. We have a distribution of all sorts of different heights. And one of the ways that this can happen genetically is that you can have many loci contributing to the phenotype. So I wrote some examples here where instead of, you know, big R making the round appearance and little r homozygote making the wrinkled appearance. Instead, you think about each genotype as having a contribution to the overall phenotype, in this example, height. So here you can think that of the many, many, many loci that contribute to height in an adult human, different loci may have different contributions to that overall stature. The next component I wanna tackle is that of association tests. And to talk about this, I'm going to first talk about T. So this story starts when Muriel Bristol, she is a scientist who studies algae. If you study algae too and you've ever encounter, encountered the genus Muriella, it's named after her. So she's having tea with R.A. Fisher, like that Fisher, the statistician Fisher, the person after whom Fisher tests are named, right? And Fisher offers her a cup of tea and the tea is already in it and she would like to add milk to it. And she says, no, no, I prefer the taste when the milk is, are, is added to the cup before the tea. And Fisher and, and someone else that they're having, having tea with says, um, can she really taste the difference if the, if the milk is added before the tea or after the tea? And they designed a test to test her. The test is set up like this. Mariel is going to get several different cups of tea but some of those cups will have had the tea added before the milk, and some will have had the milk added before the tea. In the end, they're all stirred, they look identical. This test is if she can tell whether the milk was added first or the milk was added after the tea. So she's gonna get, let's say, 10 cups of each variety, and she's gonna have to test. Do you think the tea was added first, or do you think the milk was added first? For a total of 20 different cups of tea. Now, this is an association test. We're associating her ability to guess if, if she can taste the tea, whatever it is she's tasting about it, with the actual fact of was the tea added first or the milk added first. And let's start with an assumption that she is just randomly guessing. She can't actually detect anything. So what would that look like? What do we expect that to look like if she were randomly guessing? Well, one thing you could think is that she would just guess half and half of them right, right? So for the instances where the tea was actually added first, sure, she would guess five of those cups correctly, but then five of them incorrectly. And same for the other case where the milk was added first. For five of them, she would guess that the tea was added first, and for five, she would guess that the milk was added first. How do we interpret these results? You could just look at this table and say, well, that looks like random guessing to me. And this is where R.A. Fisher came in, and he introduced some mathematics and statistics that I'm not going to get into in this course. But there are two important values that I expect you to be able to interpret, and that is a p-value and 
an odds ratio. So I'm going to say odds ratio. And we often just say OR. I'm putting that in parentheses here. Now, I don't expect you to know how to calculate these values in this class but I would, you like, I would like you to know how to interpret them. So I'm going to calculate them for you here, and I'm just going to tell you that this p-value is about 0 0.67, and the odds ratio is one. To think about what these values mean, we have to remember what it is we're testing. We're testing whether or not we think she's guessing or not. So could she get these results just by guessing? Our p-value says that yes, there's a really good chance, about a 67% chance, that she could get these results just by guessing. And our odds ratio says, is there a strong association between what she guessed had the T first and what actually had the T first and vice versa? And the odds ratio of one says, no, there's not. It was a ratio of one to one. That's what we see here. So there was no strong association. Now let's consider another situation. Let's say that in the instances when the T was actually added first, she guessed that the T was added first eight times, and it was only for two cups where the T was actually added first that she guessed that the milk was added first. And let's do the same thing for the opposite. So when the milk was added first, she got it wrong two times and she got it right eight times. So now just looking at the table, you start to guess that maybe she is actually onto something. She wasn't perfect. It wasn't 100% of the time, but there's a strong association between when the T was actually added first and when she guessed that it was added first. And if we calculate our p-value and odds ratio for this, we get a p-value of about 0 0.01, and we get an odds ratio of about 13.2. Now, how do we interpret these values? Again, the p-value is addressing whether or not she could get these results just by guessing, and it's saying there's only about a 1% chance that if she was just guessing, she would get these results. And our odds ratio, that is a, a number that's much bigger than one, tells us there's a strong positive association between when the T was actually added first and when she guessed it's first. So what we have here is our first association test. Also, it's important to note that legend has it that Muriel Bristol actually was pretty good at guessing whether the tea was added first or the milk was added first. But notice the language that I'm saying here. I'm not saying that they proved that she could taste if the tea was added first or the milk was added first, because that's not what an association test does. It can't prove that something is happening. All it can provide is evidence that there's an association. Now, let's see how this could work in, say, a clinical situation where you're wanting to find an association between a particular genotype and whether a patient is not or is affected with some condition. I'm showing the genotypes here at a particular locus, and this number in each block rep represents the number of unaffected individuals or affected individuals that had that particular genotype. So what we're seeing here is that there were 10 people with the genotype CC at this locus, there were six people with the genotype TC at this locus, and there were four people with the genotype TT. So we have the 10 homozygous C, six heterozygotes, and four homozygous T in the affected population. We also have genotype information for people who are affected with this condition that we're interested in. In here, we have five individuals whose genotype is CC, five whose genotype is TC, and 10 whose genotype is homozygous for the T allele. So now let's start to construct our association table for this genotype and this condition. So to construct my table, I need to think about what am I trying to associate? And remember, I'm trying to associate the allele in this case, this is our genomic region of interest. We're looking at a specific allele. So either the C allele or the T allele with the affected unaffected status. But I have numbers up there for genotypes, not alleles. So you might have to refresh your memory on how to do this, but we wanna find the counts of each allele. And I'm gonna walk through one with you and then maybe pause the video and, and fill in the rest for yourself. So for example, for the C allele in the unaffected population, well, I see it 10 times. That is, I see one C allele in the 10 homozygous C unaffected people. I also see it 
another 10 times in those in those same people because these unaffected individuals right here are diploid, right? They have that C allele twice. So I'm going to count it twice. I also see the C allele in the unaffected population once in the heterozygotes, but only once. So I'm only going to count that once. So when I add those up, I get a total of 26 times that I see the C allele in the unaffected population. So you can pause the video here and fill out the table for yourself. And I'm going to put the answers in in just one second. These are the answers that I get when I add up all of the alleles. I see the C allele 26 times in unaffected and 15 times, oops, sorry, and 14 times in the affected. I see the T allele 15 times in the affected and 25 times in the affected. So you might see some differences just with your eyes right now, right? There are differences in these alleles based um, between these two populations. Specifically, it looks like you're seeing the T allele much more often in the affected and the C allele much less often. But we need to do statistics to see if that association is real. When I run the test on the computer program that I'm using to do these statistics for me, I get a p-value of 0 0.01 and an odds ratio of 3.0. Now, for us, we could say that there is a very small chance that we would observe this particular distribution of alleles um, assorting with the affected unaffected status um, just by chance. So there does appear to be an association and the odds ratio can tell you kind of the strength of that association. In our last example, we saw an odds ratio of 13, which is a very strong positive association. Three is less than 13. So it's not as strong of an association as what we just saw. And to have this come full circle, let's think about something else that is new to us here. So we're saying that we do observe an association between this SNP or the, someone's genotype at this particular location and whether or not they have the disease. But look at something really important. Let's say specifically we're seeing that the T allele is associated with the disease. And yes, there are 10 homozygous TT individuals who are affected, but then there are four people who have that same genotype, homozygous TT, who are unaffected. And likewise, there are five people who are homozygous CC, that is, they don't have a T allele at all, and they're still affected. How can this be? How can we both say that there is support, that this locus is associated with the condition, but also see that there are some unaffected and affected people who have the same genotype? That is because this condition is probably not Mendelian. It's instead a complex trait. So this one locus that we're considering, this one place where the individuals have either a genotype of CC, TT, or the heterozygous, is just one of many loci that contribute to, to the phenotype. So these affected individuals who don't have the T allele may have some other some other genotype at another location that's making them present the same traits as people who do have the the homozygous tt similarly someone can have the same tt genotype at this locus as an affected person but not show symptoms because they don't have other alleles at other locations in the genome so it would really take a genome-wide approach to find all of the variants that are associated with, with this trait. We really can't do it one locus at a time. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next video.